welcome to welcome to this week's uh, endoscopy gecko and um, it's my pleasure to to host it um, let me tell you that today we've got 78 uh, registrations from Cameroon Ghana Kenya Lebanon Mozambique Norway um, Zambia Zimbabwe UK and South Africa so it's a, a hodgepodge of, of uh, individuals and that's great to see and um, on behalf of, of GECO and the Gastro Foundation in association with Project ECHO um, these are our weekly sessions and uh, obviously this this week is my turn as um, and Ed's turn as um, as host of, of the meeting and um, these sessions again are weekly next week I think is IBD and we'll um, you'll sure, surely be entertained then by uh, Dr. Watermere and Dr. S and Professor Sutshedi. And um, the, please just remember that um, we do want to make this interactive and we would like you to post your questions in the chat um, so that we can uh, interact with the speakers. Today I have two um, young men, well, compared to me, they're young men, um, but they're in their um, middle of their surgical careers, very active individuals, uh, both of them. Um, Dr. Kloppers is from here in, in Cape Town running the acute surgical service, so he sees things at the front end, and the patient that he's going to relate to you is, in fact, someone who came in through that mechanism. He's also trained as a, an HPB surgeon through the system uh, here in Cape Town. And um, the second speaker, I'll introduce him a little later. He's also um, someone who's worked with me in the past, and um, he's going to talk on, a, uh, on the ABC of ERCT. But first up is um, Christo um, Kloppers, and he's going to talk to us about obscure overt or overt obscure bleeding, whichever way you like to put it. And um, I think there are some valuable lessons from from uh, this presentation. So over to you, Christo, and uh, take it away. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the introduction, introduction of Professor Thompson. Um, as I said, yeah, the, the name of the presentation is a case of full blood of the GI beat and it will touch on some management options. Just to start off with um, the definition of obscure bleeding and its subcategories. So obscure bleeds, I mean, there's some, some varies in opinions of how many scopes you should have done, but in essence, it's a, it's a GI bleed not apparent on a, uh, on a routine upper and lower scope, and it can present in either the occult form, which is iron deficiency anemia or a positive fecal occult blood test, or the more vert form, um, where there's visible bleeding, visible rate of altered blood in, the, in, in either in the vomit or stool. So we're going to talk a little bit more on, on, on the right-hand side on a, on a, um, a vert bleed. So I'll start with a simple case. I, I, I simplified it a little bit to, for the sake of, 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 a, of an easy presentation. It's a 70-year-old female who presented with signs and symptoms uh, which looked like a acute upper GIT bleeding, see at uh, confirmed Melina, clinically Melina stools with HP of nine. Um, as per routine, she underwent an upper endoscopy, which was insignificant. Um, it was reported as normal and, and no source for bleeding was found. Um, and as such, she, she was evaluated with a, um, a semi-urgent uh, colonoscopy after, after, after PrEP, which was, which was fairly routine. Um, funny enough, uh, the colorectal surgeons did the colonoscopy and they picked up the next day she was jaundiced, which I was quite impressed with. Um, so after the colonoscopy, yeah, as I said, she was clinically jaundiced, which prompted the CT scan. Um, so I'm going to quickly take you through a couple of slides of the CT scan. Um, I'm not a radiologist either, so that we can look at it together because I think there's a couple of interesting uh, features. I'm not sure whether we can can see my uh, my my pointer yes we can 
Oh, that's great. Um, so this is actual slices of a, of a contrast at CT abdomen. Um, and the first feature that you can see, there, it looks like there's a diseased gallbladder um, with quite a thick wall, and there's a locule of air with, within the gallbladder. Um, and a couple of uh, slices down, I've just selected a, a relevant slice, as you can see, there's the outline of the gallbladder. It still looks a bit diseased, there's locules of air, and there's something in it, and, and, and to me it looks like it, like it's blood, or a, or a hematoma or clot within the gallbladder. Um, this is how our radiologist has marked it. Uh, they were obviously quite excited to, to see this, so they won't normally do that. Um, that is the, the common bile duct. It is 18 millimeters, which is quite dilated. Um, pro probably we will hear about the normal diameters later on, but uh, normally you would expect it to, 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 to be not more than six or seven millimeters. And interesting enough, uh, you can actually see contrast or, or blood um, within the duodenum. Um, and that looks to me like the same as the, uh, the contents of the gobbler. It's probably representing a uh, hematoma or clot. Um, another slice down, um, and I thought that was quite good of the analysis to pick up, um, that there's a communication between the, the diseased gallbladder and the duodenum. And another slice down, um, they reported on a GDA, gastrointestinal artery pseudoaneurysm, which is on axial slices. They were nice enough to reconstruct this in a, in a, from a different view. Uh, this is quite a nice uh, picture. I'll go through it. So this is the, the angiogram part of the CTA or the CT angiogram. Um, splenic artery, common hepatic artery, proper hepatic artery, and left and right hepatic artery. That to me is the common uh, the gastrointestinal artery. So that's artery that run uh, downwards. That's where they reported on, on, on the false aneurysm, but there you can see there is the false aneurysm. So it's a branch of the right hepatic artery, more likely the cystic artery. Um, so it seems if we, if we look at the CT scan that the, the cause of this overt obscure bleed is a serial aneurysm of the cystic artery. Um, it filled the whole biliary tree with blood as well as the gallbladder, um, which caused the jaundice. I think we've got a little poll that we can run um, as to the suggestions of the, of the participants on, on, on what we should do, what we should do, what we should do next. Uh, there's a couple of options. Um, Cheryl, I don't know if you can, you can get that poll up. You should be able to vote now. So if you can vote, mm. be good. I can't see it yet. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So what, what we want to do, uh, we want your input in, in, in this case, if you demonstrate a cystic artery blast, like we've seen on that CT, CT, CT angiogram, uh, which of these options would you, would you go for? And I think most of them are plausible. Um, Reading from the bottom, cholecystectomy, uh, right hepatic artery stent, occlusion of the septic artery, embolization of the right hepatic artery, or, or um, therapy of the septic artery with coils. I saw Onasai. Hello, Onasai. I saw Onasai joined from Zimbabwe. I've worked with him for a, for a good two years. Good to see your name. It's good to see all our old fellows coming back on and supporting this effort. Welcome, Anasai. I know what he would answer. <laughs> that he's not old like me, yeah. <laughs> uh, but also although in the middle of my career, Professor, as you introduced me. Yeah, yeah. I think we could end the poll, Cheryl, and just see what people have said. It ended. And share it. Here we it's coming up. Here we go. Um, 
Okay, so about a quarter of seat uh, surgery, um, and the rest has went, went for some sort of uh, endovascular uh, strategy. Um, uh, I, I went with the majority, um, and we opted to do a, um, a, a, a angiogram. Um, so yeah, you, you can see the figure on the left. Yes, the catheter, it's parked, it's a selected uh, uh, by, the, by the bottom approach, the, the common hepatic artery. And you can see there's a run GDA again, left hepatic, middle hepatic, which is quite common, although we don't always see it in textbooks, right hepatic artery and all blush. Um, and obviously this was done by our vascular surgeons. Our radiologists are not keen to do this, um, but we've opted to stent uh, and here you can see there's a covered stent across the take of the cystic artery in the in the right hepatic artery. Um, from a uh, from an endovascular point of view, I think it's quite a challenging thing uh, for more than one reason. Uh, it's quite a torturous vessel. Um, the take of the celiac artery to the aorta is quite acute, so sometimes they have to come from the top uh, from a brachial approach to to avoid that acute angle. Um, and it's obviously quite a small diameter vessel and stent in, in, to manipulate that uh, deployment mechanism through the uh, through the artery. The less, um, that sorted out the patient. So there's a couple of things that I, uh, and one of them actually I learned during this process is uh, immobilia accounts for less than 1% of obscure GIT bleeds. And this is something that was new to me. Quincy's triad is described clinics to clinically recognize these patients. Um, it's right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, and a GIT bleed. And the main causes for immobilia is trauma, both uh, normal trauma and idiogenic trauma, either a liver biopsy or some sort of catheterization or, or stenting work via the percutaneous route. I mean, we see it quite commonly in that context. Um, and liver tumors being a, a rarer one. Um, cystic artery aneurysms are well described, but they are even more rare. And only 25% of that 1% uh, would be secondary to, to serial aneurysm of the cystic artery. Um, it's normally secondary to cholecystitis and underlying comorbidities, especially vascular uh, disease and use of, of antithrombotic drugs could contribute. Um, and as in our case, as you, as you saw, saw on a CT scan, a serial aneurysm formation, uh, the natural progression uh, can result in fistulization. And then one can postulate that the blood can enter the GIT tract either via the fistula tract or, or via the um, biliary tree um, and, the, and the ampulla. So this, this patient was discharged well. Um, unfortunately, she represented only a month later. Now with... Uh, um, even more significant bleed um, where she was unstable. Uh, I think we've got another little poll what to do now. Cheryl, if we can try and get that one up. Yeah. Yes. So this is the same patient. Um, she had um, that covered stint placed in the right hepatic artery before. Um, and now she, it settled well, she went home, but now she's back, what would you do? And there's again some operative options for Anasai, um, either open or laparoscopic. Um, should we ride the scoper now, or should we embolize that right hepatic artery? We can probably show the result to stop it. Uh, repeat endoscopy, about a quarter. Majority said uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, some would suggest open cholecystectomy. That's good. I, uh, I again, uh, 
looks like I'm a Democrat. I, uh, I opted for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Some would have criticized me for it. Um, but just in, in, in the consideration, um, obviously, I think that was the consider consideration. Should we have an operative approach? Um, and whether it's laparoscopic or open, one can speculate about. Um, or should one endeavor in, 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 a, in a redo um, endovascular approach? Um, I just took a little slide out of a paper we, we wrote some time ago um, on these type of lesions, but it was in the context of post-operative Whipple patients because um, that's where we commonly uh, instrument this artery. Um, our vascular surgeon calls it the HBB lesion, um, where the GDA stump uh, bleeds secondly to a false aneurysm, most likely after a, after, um, a pancreatic fistula. And in this, this small series, and it was a, a published about five years ago, there's seven patients that was, uh, was either embolized or stented and half of them independent of whether they had uh, embolization or a stent because those stents it seems like they they're not patent for a long time as it's a, such a small diameter um, patients formed uh, half of our patients formed liver abscesses and i think that's the concern that you may render the part of the liver um, ischemic although 70 percent of the the blood supply would come from a portal vein the other concern is if you embolize the artery and there's a risk of a portal vein thrombosis, as in a, a bad cholecystitis, I think that's something to consider because then you will be in real trouble. Nonetheless, I think it would have been a, a very viable option to, to embolize the right hepatic artery. Um, there's a cute little video. It was me taking it. I was not operating. It's one of my uh, fellows operating. Um, and it was my ill advice. And you can see... Uh, it was just uh, they removed the clot, and there was some active bleeding from from that little false aneurysm. Um, but it was e easily solved uh, after conversion. It's actually just a simple cholecystectomy and a, a tie on on the cystic artery um, and closure of the fistula. There was no real um, need for Pringle or uh, or any. Um, control of the right hepatic artery. Uh, once opened, it was actually quite a simple procedure. And after that, the patient did fairly well. Um, so just to touch on, a, I think we've got about another five minutes left um, on, on, on some principles of the management and, and the decision-making. Um, there's some guidelines um, on, and it mostly relate to, to small bowel bleed or, or severe lower bleeds, because I think it, it's sort of the, the same algorithm. And this is just always to remind myself, I put this slide, it actually comes from some of my undergraduate presentations, but it's important to remember, um, and this is the, the ATLS classes of hemorrhagic shock, but the relevance for me here is, it's easy to remember because it's a, a tennis score 15, 30, 40, 40, but once you're hypertensive for, with blood class, you actually in class four shock. And, and if you can see, you've lost two liters of blood. So I think that's important to just to recognize somebody who's in hypotensive shock with bleeding has lost half their blood volume. So one has to be proactive about resussing them. Um, and as these patients are often um, comorbid patients, probably need blood products, products, products early on. Um, just to put it in context again, often these patients with se severe acute upper bleeds um, with could present like a, a lower GIT bleed. So always consider that when, uh, when there's massive bleeding, which appears to be a lower GIT bleed as it is not Melina, it could be um, from, a, from a brisk upper bleed. Um, and it's actually easy to, con to exclude as a, as a G-scope is, is, is accessible to most and quite rapid to do. Um, the benefit of a nasogastric tube, um, I think there's not, there's not uh, agreement in the, in the literature about that. So that's probably your own practice. Um, so the choice between a, a CTA and a DSA, obviously um, the availability would play a role here. Yeah? Um, but to me, there's very little disadvantage to a, a CT angiogram. Um, only thing is you can't intervene, but it is 
non-invasive, it's quite sensitive, it's rapid, it picks up bleeds from 0 0.3 mils per, uh, per hour, um, it localizes well, and it's fairly widely available. Um, a visceral angiogram, obviously, you've got the, uh, the possibility to, to intervene, and it localizes well, um, but you do need the skill set and available availability to, in our practice. I mean, it's a it's a mixed practice between the radiologist and uh, the vascular surgeons. These are visceral things that the, the, the vascular surgeons tend to do. Um, but I suppose that depends on the way you practice. Um, so as said, we, we've used it quite extensively in, in this disease. And uh, there's a couple of benefits with it. We even mark bleeds um, in the small bowel with, with wires. If you're concerned about uh, bowel schema with embolization. For me, in, in practice, I don't mind embolizing bleeding bowel because um, you need to stop it. And if there's bowel ischemia or, or bowel complications, it is then localized and one can deal with that operatively. Um, they always talk about the red cell scan in, a, in, the, in the literature. Uh, to me, that's an absolutely useless investigation um, in this setting. Um, and it's something that we, we haven't really used. Um, repeat endoscopy, I think if, if, if you read the literature about up to 75% of, of, of obscure bleeds, it's just a missed or overlooked pathology. So it's always worthwhile um, to repeat or at least consider repeat of the upper scope in if not the lower scope too. Um, a little bit of extent, out of the extent of this talk, so I'm, I'm going to fly over the next three slides about the uh, other in, modalities available that we didn't use in, in, in this case, uh, the variety of small bowel enteroscopies, uh, whether it's single balloon, double balloon, or, or, or the newer spiral endoscopies. Um, in expert hands, these things are great and, and, and also give you the ability to, to intervene in, in small bowel pathology. Um, other options are intraoperative assisted endoscopy. Um, and, and we have ended up using this in, in various types of pathology where you assist, assisted by a surgeon, either continuing the bowel from the top or the bottom or a scoping via interostomy, um, the appendix or small bowel to visualize the lumen of the small bowel. And we can, for the sake of time, go past that. So this is a little algorithm we suggest for, uh, for, for these pathologies. If you've got a vert obscure bleed, you want to repeat endoscopy for that half the patients that you would miss a pathology, be it a Cameron lesion or a or, or whatever, um, which you might see on, on a second a second look. Stable patients follow a little bit of a different algorithm. Uh, there you would consider uh, the video capsules or, or some form of small bowel enteroscopy. The unstable lot or the persistent or recurrent bleeds, you want to do something different. If they're really unstable and they're not going to tolerate a CT angiogram or some form of angiogram, you want to go to theater. Otherwise, as for our case, you're going to do a CT angiogram always if the patient is, is stable enough, even while with while ongoing resus, depending on what you find, you can do then a, a, a visceral angiogram. And your last option would be to do some sort of operative solution with plus minus scopes on the table. If the patient settle, obviously you can go again back to um, small bowel uh, endoscopy. Um, so in summary, stable patients where possible, um, get the timing of your appropriate investigation, try your utmost best to localize um, the bleed prior to considering surgery and avoid blind resection because that's not very helpful. I think we uh, just on time for, uh, for a little bit of a discussion. I'm going to go back to you, Professor. Um, Thanks very much, Christo. If you can uh, just stop your stop your sharing, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, that's a a, a fascinating uh, fascinating case and presentation. And obviously, it came back to bite you a little bit after you uh, had managed uh, what you thought was very effectively and cleverly in the first uh, first instance. Um, are there any any um, questions from, um, from, there's one from Noni, and again, I think you answered it towards the end there. 
any role for capsule endoscopy after repeating upper and lower endoscopy? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I think uh, um, in uh, obscure bleeds, per definition, is mo most of them would, would sit in the small bowel. So if you're confident, you've ruled out foregut and, um, and colonic uh, pathologies, uh, in the stable patient, the capsule would, would certainly be very high up on your, on, on your algorithm. In the unstable patient, it's a bit tricky. Yeah. I think the, the, other, the other thing is that I do think that angiography is particularly useful in the setting that you found it, in that both hemobilia and hemosuccus, i.e. bleeding from the pancreatic false aneurysms, will, will be picked up irrespective of whether they're actively bleeding at the time, because there is an actual defect. Whereas for mid-gut lesions usually, they're usually associated with terminal bleeds and they have to be bleeding at the time of, of, of the um, intervention for you to see them so that you can localize them. So I think foregut, one has a lower index and obviously I think the CTA or even just an ordinary CT um, which most individuals will have access to can be very valuable in pointing you towards where the, the pathology um, is. Um, I don't see any other, other questions there. Again, maybe if we can just go back to, to the resources issue. Um, uh, again, not everyone has access to interventional angiography. And um, I think that's something that one should bear in mind. So it comes back to, to the approach that you would use if you only knew that you had hemobilia, which is what the CT uh, gave you in the gallbladder. Um, and I think um, for me, the, the safe approach would be an open cholecystectomy because then you would be able to control things if you, if you did get mischief. I'm sure some very talented laparoscopic surgeons could also control uh, the vascular structure as well, but, but probably for um, those individuals who won't see this very frequently, um, it, it's, a, it's a reasonable thing to do. And you can always get control of the common hepatic, um, if not the right hepatic, for sure, which would also help you just control the initial sort of uh, exploration um, of, the, of the gallbladder. Yeah. Okay, I, I believe I've got a noisy chair, so I'll try to stop rocking before I'm there. I'll try and get some WD-40 as soon as I can. But thank you very much for that, Christo. It's a very nice case, and I think lots of uh, illustrative lessons from it. So now, now it's, my, it's my pleasure to, to uh, hand over to John DeVar. Um, John um, trained with me as a surgical registrar in, in Durban before I... Springbok slots are, are now full, um, especially as they beat the British Lions. So um, what we're going to hear about here is, is um, the ABC of, of ERCP. And I think just before we start, um, I'd like to just run one of the polls, just to get an idea of those in the audience as to how many are actually performing uh, ERCP. So if you could vote and just give us some idea of what the spectrum is in, in the audience that we've got. Let me just end it there, John, and I'll let you comment and uh, then you can start your talk.
Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'd just like to thank uh, Professor Thompson for that wonderful interaction. It's really an honor to be here. Um, Prof has taught me a lot over the years, and it's really uh, wonderful that he's still involved in teaching um, you know, to this extent. So thank you for the opportunity, and I'm humbled to be here. Um, it's interesting to see that 70% of the audience is actually doing uh, fewer than uh, 10 ERCPs a year. So um, with this, it gives me a great pleasure to talk about the ABCs of um, ERCPs. Um, I come from Krishani Baragwanath, where we actually do a significant amount, almost 900 a year. And um, I'm going to talk uh, as an overview about the endoscopic suite setup, uh, basic ERCP training courses, uh, standardization of instruction, um, understanding the anatomy of the impulla, uh, dealing with diff difficult biliary access, and a little bit on the complications. Now, this is what our endoscopic suite looks like um, at Barrow. What we can see on this side is the um, is, is a screening table. Um, here you can see that this arm can move down, and I'll talk to its position where it should be just now. You can see the stack, which is um, relatively standard. Um, here on this side, we have our cupboards where we've got all our accessories, and here we've got a laser on this side for when we do more advanced procedures. But what's more important is the emergency uh, trolley, which is available readily and easily, um, as these things can go wrong quite quickly. Now, the team is important, and you'll note that the endoscopist face is actually blocked off here. And the reason for this, and why I put this in, is that you can't start ERCPs without a team. If you don't have a decent radiographer, if you don't have a decent assistant who understands what you want to do, and if you don't have a proper sedationist or uh, anaesthetist, you may run into big trouble and you won't be successful. This is Palesa in this picture. She's about to have a baby and she's my regular um, sort of assistant. And my cannulation rates actually drop when she's on maternity leave and we've noted this. But the point is that you, if you're gonna be embarking on this, you really need to make sure that you set up a proper team. Now, sedation, which we'll come back to a little bit later, is the key to success or the key to trouble. So if you don't get this right, um, your ERCPs won't be successful or your patient won't survive. So it's really important. And we've moved away from just uh, Rapifen and Dormicum to a more propofol-based uh, uh, sedation technique. And uh, we don't have any fancy pumps, uh, but we are able to do this quite successfully without um, any complications uh, or major respiratory issues. Um, and now when you set up your fluoroscopic room, I think it's quite important. And I spoke to that just now, the angles of degrees, which one needs to look at is quite important between your fluoroscopy and your endoscopic screen. And you can see they were side by side, but try and keep them in this 10 degree angulation, particularly when you're doing a big list, when you're going on for a long time. It's really difficult and challenging in most cases. And when you're starting to do more than sort of 10 cases a day, I can tell you that it's quite taxing on the body and you may not, you may miss things and you may not see things appropriately. So you need to learn how to use your fluoroscopy very well. You need to position it well and you need to be able to rotate it to be able to see the biliary tree and the pathology. Now, this is what we all strive for is to be able to see a, uh, a deep biliary cannulation and getting into the ampulla and being able to make such, um, uh, such a sphincterotomy and we get release of golden bile here. This is probably what we aim, we all wish to see. Unfortunately, it takes a long time to get there. And again, this is one of the uh, inaugural uh, ERCP training courses that was actually put together by Professor Thompson and uh, Professor Bezos, together with the father of ERCP, Peter Cotton, and Trisha from Basel and Stoke. Um, here you can see there's a famous guy who's already been mentioned on a sci. Um, he's really famous today because he's um, in this picture as well. And he was part of this inaugural course. And this course was really important because it did two things. It took trainees through um, ERCPs from absolutely novices to those that were slightly more accomplished um, to taking the trainers to how to actually train. And the trainer should be able to be or should be an expert should be able to deconstruct the task, should be able to narrate the task. And that was something I really learned is how to be able to narrate a task um, when teaching a sort of psychomotor skill. We should also know that we shouldn't always take over the task. I mean, it's our anxiety that leads to that. 
And we should be able to, once we've accomplished and uh, uh, gone past the obstruction, to be able to handle the task back to the trainee. Now, the standardization of the instruction medium was very important. And similarly to the um, JAG training system for colonoscopy, we've moved away from talking about the dials on the scope to rather what the scope tip is doing. And really when it comes to ERCPs, we've standardized this and there are really 10 movements that we speak about. It's really tip up, tip down, tip right, tip left, uh, clockwise rotation, counterclockwise rotation, push in, pull back, and bridge up, bridge down to use the elevator. And I think that these sort of directions have almost made it like a Google Maps version so that the trainee actually knows exactly what you're saying. So doing scope work off and outside patients is really important when you start. And then we come to the insertion. And with the insertion, because we've got these instructions, it becomes really straightforward. So I can even take you through that right now, how you would insert that. And it really is, it really is almost foolproof. And what you can see is by doing this and being able to direct people, I think that uh, Professor Thompson's been involved in a lot of telemedicine. And by watching, you could actually direct a person how to be able to do an ERCP by being hands off and being there to support them once they've had some degree of, of, of training. So the insertion is much easier, cannulation is much easier and then completion of the task. And what I've noticed is that my trainees have gone from about four months, taking about four months of training before they get into position and start cannulating to actually after six um, major sessions with us or six weeks, they're able to actually get into position quite comfortably and they're able to start cannulation. It's measurable, it's reproducible, and it's really uh, what we should be doing in all our setups and in our, uh, um, in our, in our sort of uh, training of our uh, students. So this is a simulator here that we've got, and um, this is a Castamanio mod model, and it's really good because it takes you through the standard and pull um, and allows you to learn to do deep cannulation and also understand the anatomy. What it also does is it's able to change the position of the ampulla to make it slightly more difficult. And so by the time the actual trainee gets into uh, a patient, they already have an idea of tip up, tip down, how to engage, how to cut the sphincteroxamy. And this was really um, a change in the way we thought about things. And this course was really phenomenal. And it's a pity that we haven't really pushed on and done another course, but I think that we really need to start um, using these uh, uh, simulators and we need to start making sure that we're spreading the uh, sort of uh, basic training skills um, out there. And what we found is that taking our patients, which are you know, our trainees from unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent is much faster and then going across to consciously competent is much faster. Once they get there, they become unconsciously competent, but they need to learn to deconstruct it again in order to teach somebody else. So this is a very important diagram and this is really from the train the trainers course. Now, just going to the ampulla and looking at the ampulla, we've got the bile duct that runs between 11 and 12 o'clock. And at sort of between 12 and sort of two o'clock, we have the pancreatic duct that goes off a lot flatter. So once you start to understand the anatomy, the engagement and the deep biliary cannulation becomes much easier. Once again, there are variations and these variations need to be noted where you've got a short common channel you've got separate or no common channels, and then you've got a long common channel and that brings about issues on its own. But in general, the no common channel is what really is the, the more common sort of uh, appearance that we see. Now you can divide the ampulla into type one, type two, type three, and type four. And that type one is really the straightforward regular papilla. Type two is the one that we often hate to see, which is a flat uh, ampulla and it's normally less than three millimeters in diameter. Type 4 is protruding and pendulous. And if you're going to start uh, learning how to use needle knives, these are the ampullas you want to try and use it, uh, learn on. And then finally, type 4, which is a creased, ridged, or hooded ampulla, which can be quite uh, a challenge. Again, just to point out the ampulla and just to show the more careful portion of the common bile duct versus a flatter, more lateral portion um, um, showing the pancreatic duct. Now, when you get into position, the trainee needs to understand where to position the ampulla in order to get deep biliary cannulation. And you can see on the left side is the position that you want to be into the biliary cannulation versus what you generally look like when you're trying to do pancreatic work. 
Now, the three most important thing about, things about ERCP is exactly the same as property. It's position, position, and position. So you're not going to get any success if you don't get into the correct position. Now, when we look at the scope itself, the scope also has unique positions. And the short position, which we speak about in this case, is what we really aim for um, in most ERCPs. It allows easy access for most of the um, uh, instruments that we use, accessories. It ha has more torque, particularly for higher um, strictures, and there's less chance of falling out. Mm -hmm. However, a lot of the times we have anatomical distortion, and this really prevents us from getting to the short position. And we may need to use a long position just to gain access. And once we've gained access and cut us with gyroxomy, we can then shorten the scope and get more torque and have access to that balloon tree. Now, this is a, a picture of a semi-long position. And um, sorry, we'll just go back there. This is a semi-long position. And the important thing about the semi-long position is it's really good for accessing the minor and polar. This is a patient who's got pancreatic divism, who's had recurrent pancreatitis. And you can see the major ampulla at the bottom draining bile. And up at the top here, you can see us gaining access to the minor ampulla. Um, I think it's quite important to understand the different positions of the scopes to help you gain access or deep uh, biliary cannulation. Now, there are times where we fail, and failure in selective biliary cannulation in the best of hands can be, uh, not mine, but in the best of hands can be about 5 to 10%. The definition of a difficult biliary cannulation is still unclear. And what might be simple for you may be slightly more difficult for me. And there, there, there are a couple of things around technique that might make it slightly more challenging. But the problem is that once we start having difficulty um, uh, cannulating and we keep prodding and the longer we take, the, longer, the, the, the more chances we have of complications. And Obviously, post ERCP pancreatitis is the most frequent complications. And in general, the studies report rates between 5 to 10%, but it can increase significantly in difficult cannulations to well over 20%, particularly in female patients and obese patients um, and those with benign disease. So, what I'd like to say here at this point in time is please make sure that if you are embarking on ERCPs, that this is for therapy and definitely not for diagnosis. So we really need to make sure that we have the right indication. Now, why is it a, a problem with ability access? And we can have cases that are extremely difficult. There can be ERCP reasons, but we just can't get there. And the reason is that the patient may have had previous gastric surgery, like uh, B2, uh, uh, the 2s or Renoir reconstructions. They may have large parasophageal hiatus hernias or they may have gastric outlet obstruction, or the tumor itself may have infiltrated the duodenum, and particularly around D1, D2 area, making it impossible to get around the corner to get into uh, vision of that ampulla. There may be, once we get to the ampulla, ampullary pathology, and the, 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 there may be tumor at the ampulla, uh, the, the, the ampulla may be buried in the diverticulum, and there may be certain anatomical variations that may make it impossible for us to get in. Now, when we're having a difficult biliary uh, cannulation, I think we need to step back. And some common reasons are there's a learning curve. Sometimes the scope is not insufflating adequately. Sometimes there's poor conscious sedation. Sometimes there's an inadequate air sublation. And sometimes we're unable to line up correctly. And then again, there's anatomical factors that may make it slightly more challenging. The tumor may be pushing up against us. There may be pancreatitis or a collection or whatever the case might be. And it might make it really challenging to get in. But just ask yourself the question, is my scope working adequately? Is my patient sedated? And that's quite important for us to just kick off there to, uh, with troubleshooting to make sure it's, it's, it's not technical. I'd like to stop at this point um, because I'm about to start to talk about post ERCD pancreatitis. And Prof, if I could ask you to help me with the poll, please. And so, so we, what we really want to know is what is the um, um, threshold for the range of cannulation attempts um, that elevate the risk of pancreatitis about 5%. So the number of attempts, 
So whether three to four, seven to eight, or nine to ten, or greater than that. Rob, I wonder if you could stop the poll for us. Let's have a look at some of the results. So most people say, what is the threshold of cannulation attempts? Three to four. Fifty-five percent say that. Seven to eight is forty percent, and only five percent say nine to ten. Okay, we're going to have another quick poll before we move on to this. Uh, Prophet, you could ask the second question, please. Don't see it coming up just yet. Okay, so this next question after what length of time um, of attempting cannulation elevates the risk of pancreatitis about 5%. So is it 2 to 5 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes, or 10 to 15 minutes? I wonder if we could stop the poll again so we can share the results. Okay, so majority say five to 10 minutes. So 50% of people say five to 10 minutes and 38% of them say um, 10 to 15 minutes. So let's have a look at what the literature says. And if we look at that, the risk of post ERCP pancreatitis is based on the number of cannulation attempts. What we see here is it significantly starts to increase. And here we can see that actually, if, it, if you look at the 5% mark, it's about seven to eight percent, um, but once we start to head to nine to ten percent, it really exponentially increases. So I think that this is really a difficult thing for me because once you're looking at this target, you almost don't count the number of times that you're poking and prodding. So I think that's why they've also included um, the time to cannulation. And if we look at the time to cannulation here, what we can see is that between ten to fifteen minutes is where the risk of uh, ERCP pancreatitis starts to shoot upwards. So I think that when trainees are having a go, I think that um, whilst you're in the room, you should have a, a, a time limit of about five minutes and maybe even set a clock where they get a go. And then if they aren't successful, then at least the train, trainer can take over, try and help and reduce that risk of pancreatitis. And, and if they fail, then they need to go on to other strategies. So what are the other strategies? So repeated cannulation of the pancreatic duct, we can use the double guide wire technique. And that means you leave the guide wire in the uh, pancreatic duct, which stabilizes that ampulla and just points you in the right direction. So if you elevate your cannula and you almost drop it onto that guide wire, as you push it in, you kind of line yourself up perfectly to get uh, biliary cannulation. And this is a technique I use fairly frequently in, in, in my practice. Now, here's another sort of um, uh, strategy that one may use in, once you into in, in the pancreatic duct. Talk about a pancreatic duct septotomy. And if you look at it versus the double guide wire technique. Now, basically, you've got your, um, um, your cannula in the pancreatic duct and you cut upwards and you hope to hit the biliary tree. I do not practice this in my, in my practice. I do not teach my trainees this in my practice. I find this quite dangerous because Often the pancreatic duct leads you away and you can actually end up causing a perforation as you go away. But if we look at what the evidence says, the evidence says slightly different to what I'm saying. In fact, the double guide wire technique has a higher rate of post ERCD pancreatitis compared to the transpancreatic uh, uh, septotomy. However, again, I say to you that I don't feel comfortable with that technique and I don't advise my trainees um, to use that. I'd rather go on to something slightly more different, which is a pre-cut uh, needle knife. And when you look at this, the, the, the needle knife is hanging at this ampulla, it looks cherry red and it's really swollen. And we decide to now cut uh, the, we decide to now convert to the needle knife. And this is not really where it should be used. We should be early on converting to a needle knife sphincterotomy and 
any fellow who is serious in performing ERCPs should really be taught um, how to do a proper and legal life certificate. And if we look at how to do this, there are two methods, and the one method is an upcut technique, and this is what I generally use is an upcut technique, or you can do a fistulotomy, um, depending on position, and if it's slightly more difficult, I resort to a fistulotomy, but in general, I, I prefer to do an upcut technique. And this is just an example of an upcut technique where you can see us imagining where the, the biliary gut is running at this stage, and slowly cutting through this bulging ampulla. This is actually a distal stricture on a patient who had a malignancy, an ampullary malignancy, believe it or not. And uh, we we're able to open this up. She wasn't fit for surgery up front. So we we're able to open this up. We were able to drain her. And here you can see the uh, pink mucosa of the bile duct coming to view just there. We were able to cannulate that quite nicely. And we were able to drain her successfully. So if we look at the uh, evidence about the effect of pre-cut sphincterotomy on post-endoscopic retrograde uh, phalangiopancreatopathy pancreatitis, this was a systematic review published in 2014, and it really shows that early pre-cut implementation does not increase the risk of post-ERCP pancreatitis. So I think that that's quite an important finding, and I think that most of our fellows now are being taught very early to convert to this. So I'd just like to touch on briefly on other complications, and the other complications include um, uh, perforations. And if you look at this, once you get this retroperitoneal free air, it often takes our feet away when we, when we see this. And this was one of my fellows um, who was in the endoscopic suite, and this is what you can see at the moment. We're not looking at a lumen, but we're actually looking at a perforation. Um, there, you can see a little bit of blood. And in the top left-hand corner, you'll see the true lumen come into view at the end. We were still in our earlier days and uh, we, we tried to clip this. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the use of these clipping devices don't work very well with, um, uh, with, with um, a side beam scope. However, I think what works much better is um, a fully covered um, duodenal stent um, in, the city, uh, in, the, in, in, in the sort of uh, setting. This was what the uh, CT image looked like, and um, the patient actually did okay in the end, but had a really stormy post, um, uh, post uh, perforation course. And when we look at bleeding, the incidence in the literature is quoted between one to 48%. But in fact, it happens fairly um, rarely, and probably less than 3% of our ERCPs bleed. But when we look at it, there's a grading system, mild, moderate, and severe. And essentially, if your HB drops more than three grams per deciliter, it's seen as mild, uh, less than three grams, it's mild. If it goes more, uh, less than, uh, if you need to transfuse, but less than four units, and no intervention is required, it's moderate, and if it's severe, if more than five units, or angiography is required, or surgery is required. Most of the patients that need can be treated quite easily with an adrenaline injection, um, or thermal or electrocortery, or you can even use mechanical clips. But again, I, I haven't had great success with clips, to be honest. Um, I think that when it continues to bleed, I resort quite quickly to a fully covered uh, metal stent. Um, and, and that seems to sort uh, most of the issues out um, quite comfortably. So our time's coming to an end. And I'd just like to talk about, so to conclude by saying, you know, the endoscopic setup is really important. And the team is even more important. And you really need to have a dedicated uh, set of people with you that's prepared to go the full, full way with you. Uh, when we look at uh, standardization of teaching techniques, this has really shortened the learning curve. And I would really advise anybody who's interested in learning ERCPs to attend one of these courses. Um, I think it's really, it's, it's, it's very important for your perception, for your orientation, and, and just to shorten that uh, learning curve. And then the position of the ampulla is really important uh, to cannulation. And then we discussed the double guide wire technique and the needle knife techniques and early use of the needle knife to prevent post ERCP pancreatitis. And I'd just like to end by saying, just remember that ERCP should be used for therapy alone and not for diagnosis. That will reduce your complications. With that, I thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks very much indeed. Um, that, uh, yeah, there's some messages there after my own heart. Um, I think uh, there's one 
Uh, Akui, can I ask, actually ask you if you can unmute and show us your video? Akui is from Zambia, but she's now um, trained and working in, uh, in uh, Rhode Island at Brown University. Um, and she, uh, perhaps we could get some of her views on what to do when you can't get in with uh, your first attempts with um, a guide wire cannulation. Akui, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, so I um, uh, thank you so much. That was really a great um, presentation, John. So I, I agree. I actually um, also like the double Y technique. Um, I think if I'm unable to, your tech makes a huge difference. I guess I should take it a step back. So whoever is, um, you know, teching for you in terms of, uh, you know, helping with flexing and uh, cannulating, I think that's the first step. But if I'm unable to get in, I also do try um, a double wire technique. Um, and then if that doesn't work, I, I think it's always good to know when you can call for help. And so I would call a colleague. Um, if you're alone, I don't think it hurts to um, hold off until the following day and then try again. Um, but double wire technique in the immediate is what I would do, getting help from someone else. And then if the patient is in a position to wait, um, then the following day, if they're not, then you'd use other methods in terms of um, IR guided and stuff. Um, can I ask another question of you? It's very simple and you can just suck a number out of your head, but I think there is some evidence for it now. So how, how many ERCPs should you, do you think it takes to become competent to cannulate 80% of the time? in your fellows, do you monitor that? Do you have any key performance? You know, that's, that's really, really a great, um, I think that's a great question. And it's so, you know, some of the data may suggest the magical number of 200, um, but it's really hard um, to say, because sometimes you may hit the 200 and still not be able to cannulate 80% of the time. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily always uh, rely on the, on the volume. Um, but what they do say though is less than 50 a year in terms of maintaining skills is also not, um, not a, good, a good number. So basically you need volume to be able to maintain, um, to be able to maintain skills. Thank you. Um, John, uh, that's one of the things that we, we really haven't done nationally here and that is monitor sort of competency. Um, and I'm not sure how um, the college should address some issues uh, applies to all interventional specialties. Um, it's not something that we've really tackled very well in South Africa. Yeah, I think, I think you're 100% right, Prof, because we don't really have adequate formal assessments. Um, and I think that um, with this kind of training that we've developed, we need to really just push on a little bit more. And uh, we need to start establishing formal assessments. I think that we need to maintain competency uh, by those numbers. And I think that we should be checking what we're doing. You know, I really think that we need to be honest about it uh, because the complications and the fallouts are huge. So I really think that we have an obligation actually um, as societies like HBDSA as well as the college. I think that we really need to start introducing these formative assessments. Thanks, John. I think um, we've sort of, um, there's nothing much in the, in the, uh, the chat box. Uh, I've changed my seat, so hopefully it's not squeaking anymore. I, I can't hear it squeaking because I've got my headphones on. So I'll, I'll have to take some lessons. Um, but, I just have uh, one quick question. Is yes, that okay? Exactly. Yes, so my, the, the quick question I have um, has to do with the uh, quality of endoscopy centers. So I'm actually curious, I know we mentioned individuals, how do you monitor the centers that open up? What are the regulations for individuals to open up an endoscopy um, center? You know, Because anyone interested can easily pop up a shop, but how do you monitor that this is a quality endoscopy center? Um, well, maybe I can ask, um, Onisai um, trained with us, he's in Zimbabwe. And he's only just recently, so probably did 200 to 250 ERCPs with us. But he's just set up his setup in Zimbabwe. And perhaps he could tell us 
exactly how how that happens. I think um, he might give you give us some insight. We don't have any controls on it in South Africa, um, but basically all the training is done in in eight university GI units. Um, that's where the training is done, and so there is some centralization of the training. There's very few individuals are being trained in the private sector. They move into the private sector. And in fact, most of the gastroenterologists, uh, medical gastroenterologists don't do it because it's too high risk and they don't have the volume to, to maintain their skills. So they, they are fewer um, gastroenterologists with a large practice in ERCP out, out in, the, in the, our private sector. But on a side, perhaps you could, could let us know what uh, difficulties you've had trying to set up a service in, in Zoom. Um, thank you very much, Prof, uh, for, for asking me to, to contribute. Right, certainly it, it has been quite a daunting task to, to, to set up an ERCP service. Um, and up to now, um, I've been here for quite a while now, but we are still in the process of trying to set up a proper endosco endoscopy um, uh, service. Um, you, you see, with, with our economic issues, it's been difficult to get the equipment, uh, the basic equipment to actually start a service. In the end, we, we, we just had to do with the little we had to just get it going and hope, hoping that once we start getting going, uh, we can get buy-in from, um, from the uh, state hospitals to try and um, invest in this equipment. At the moment, the equipment that is available is privately sourced and it's only available in the private sector at the moment. Um, it's, it's, it's not very easy to set it up in the, in the, in the, in the state at the moment. We have found it very difficult. Um, in general, endoscopy, we've got quite a few people doing endoscopies in, in general endoscopy, upper GI and, and colonoscopes. And um, yeah, people have set up their own sort of shops. We don't have any sort of control mechanisms that we have for quality and so forth. It's still a work in progress. Um, we were hoping that if we have got numbers of people doing these things, we could come up together and sort of set up standards. Um, but at the moment, we don't have that here. In the, in the meantime, it's always the, difficult. It's always difficult to, 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 to set up something in private. It's usually supposed to start in state and then cascade down to private, but it's, we are doing it the other way around here. And obviously, yeah. it's difficult to control someone who starts his own uh, service in, yeah. in the private. That's my own experience with other countries in Africa as well um, that, that they are. Um, the only way they can set up the services is on an individual basis in a private um, clinic. Um, they'd be, they've been relatively unsuccessful at setting it up where the volume must be. But I, th I think there are also things that one should think about when training in Africa, and that's that you want basically to get biliary drainage as, as a key performance indicator rather than um, some of the fancy things that we do. And I think there are ways of grading what you want to achieve in ERCP um, and that we should uh, uh, walk before we can run. Um, so th thanks for that, uh, that input. Um, and I'm sure others might want to share your experiences with how you've got it going. I hope that answers your questions, Zachary, at least a little bit, or gives you insight. Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you so much. Anyway, I think, um, that's um, um, really the end of the session. Um, I'd like to thank um, uh, Echo India and, and also Echo Me Mexico for hosting us and providing us with this platform and technical support. Um, our thoughts are with Karen Fenton, who's making um, a, a recovery from her, her critical illness. And we wish her all, all the best um, going forward. And to Cheryl, who's now taken on the task of, of being our local liaison for the meeting. Thank you very much, Cheryl. So um, that's, that's all for now, folks. And um, thanks again. Hope to see you next week on the IBD one. And um, keep well and keep in touch. And we're always looking for cases from your side. So we're very interested to hear from any of you who are on this call 
um, for our feedback and for cases that you think um, we could help you with management issues, either related to endoscopy or where endoscopy forms part of, of the management algorithm. So thanks once again, and um, we'll call it a halt there. Thank you.